Hello and welcome everyone. Today's presentation is on the immune response in COVID-19 infection. So let's look first into the genomic characteristics of this new novel coronavirus. This was one of the most initial studies that was published after the virus was detected. Here we see that the virus has a very close relationship with the bat strain almost 95% similarity and almost 75% similarity with the SARS-CoV virus. So this is the reason why the virus was named as SARS-CoV-2 because of its similarities with the SARS-CoV virus. Now uh, here we can see that it belongs to the lineage B while the uh, MERS-CoV is to the lineage C. As we know that the SARS-CoV virus enters to the ACE2 receptor and the MERS-CoV virus enters to the CD26 receptor. During that time, we were not sure as to what was the receptor for novel coronavirus. Now looking into this, uh, this was the search for the intermediate host. We know the primary host was the bat and the end host was human but we were not sure about the intermittent. Even right now also, we are not sure about the intermittent host, but the most likely animal is the pangolin, which has a very much similarity with the novel coronavirus. So let's see how this particular disease compares with MERS and SARS. As we can see, the mortality rates in SARS and MERS was very, very high. But the problem with the novel coronavirus or the SARS-CoV-2 is the high infectivity. Because of its highly contagious nature, it has infected million population right now. So even though it has a lesser mortality rate, the total number of death rates has well surpassed that of SARS and MERS. So if we see the R0 or the reproductive number for Novel corona is 2.2 to 2.6, while that for MERS is less than 1 and for the SARS is 1.4 to 5.5. So what it basically means is one person with a novel coronavirus infection can infect up to 2.6 persons, while for MERS it is less than 1 and for SARS for all practical purposes around 1.4. So the number of persons a uh, infected individual can infect is very very less for SARS and MERS which is the primary reason these two diseases never really ended up being a huge pandemic. So if we see the epidemic doubling time for the novel coronavirus is just six days while for MERS it was 90 days and for SARS it was around 14 to 15 days. So the number of patients is very very rapidly increasing in the novel corona infection. So let's see how this virus actually infects us. So how does it enter into its target cell? So this is one of the most initial trials again. It looked into the receptors that is ACE2 and cellular protease TMP RSS2. These were the two receptors which are mainly targeted by the SARS-CoV-2 to enter the target cell. So here we see that when there is a presence of TMPRSS2 receptor, the entry of the novel coronavirus into the cell is much more improved. The findings in presence of anti ACE2 antibody is that the entry of the novel coronavirus is much more reduced into the cell, which means that the, it requires the ACE2 receptors for its entry into the cell. So what happens in presence of antibodies? So here we see as the concentration of the antibody is gradually increased, the entry of the virus into the cell is reduced. So you must have seen the recent paper regarding the convalescent plasma. So there is a possibility that convalescent plasma can be utilized to reduce the infectivity of this particular disease. So let's look into the structure of the virus. So it has get, got a membrane glycoprotein, it has got a nucleocapsid protein, it has got an envelope protein and it has got a spike protein. Apart from these four proteins, it has got a single-stranded RNA. So 
this basically shows the pathophysiology how the virus enters so the virus attaches itself to a receptor the ACE2 and thereby it enters the cell and after entering the cell it releases its RNA into the cytoplasm where it undergoes translation and proteolysis and thereby enters the nucleus where it undergoes subsequent transcription and formation of the viral proteins so then these viral proteins are sent into the Golgi apparatus where they are assembled and then new viral particles are formed and once the new viral particle is formed it is released into the circulation so what is the immunopathology of COVID-19 the site of initial infection of SARS-CoV-2 is still unknown what we do know is that the commonest affected is the respiratory system because of the predominance of the ACE2 receptors in the epithelial lining. Though the GI tract also has a significantly high concentration of ACE2 receptors, but still the GI symptoms, though they were more seen in the SARS infection, is very rare in the COVID-19 infection. Now, in this particular study, out of 41 hospitalized patients, very high levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines were observed in severe cases of COVID-19. So this so-called cytokine storm can initiate a viral sepsis and inflammatory induced lung injury. So let's look into the immune response that the body generates to the viral infection. So there are two types of immune response. The first is the innate immune response, which is predominantly done by the macrophages. So this is something which is non-specific and it's the body's response to anything foreign that enters. The second is the more specific response, which targeted attack on the cells with cells or antibodies. This is called the acquired immunity. Now let's look into the innate immune response to SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now before going into that, let's deal a little bit regarding the major histocompatibility complex. These are a set of proteins which are present in the cell surface which help in identifying a foreign protein from a own protein. So what is HLA? HLA is MHC which is present in humans. So there are basically three types of major histocompatibility complex 1, 2 and 3. 3 is not very essential. MHC1 is something which is expressed in all the cells and MHC2 is something which is expressed in professional antigen presenting cells. So why are we discussing all this? We are discussing all this is because there is something called variation in the HLA. So the HLA variation can be a risk factor in some groups. So there have been a lot of HLA groups which have been found, especially with MHC1, which predispose a patient to a more severe form of infection. So these particular groups who will be having a severe infection is still not yet known in SARS-CoV-2, but this is a major area of research. But this could be one of the reasons why some people have a serious infection, while some do not. So let's see how our body fights against this particular virus. So as the viral proteins and the virus enter the cell, there are two receptors which are present on the endosomes which detect them. That is the tall right receptor 3 and the tall right receptor 7. So the most important one is the tall right receptor 3. So the TLR3, once it detects the viral products, it binds with TRIF, that is the TRIF and thereby forms a complex with TRAF3, 6 and RIP1. So this particular complex results ultimately in formation of nuclear factor kappa beta and type 1 interferon. Once the TLR7 detects, what it does it is attaches itself to the MyD88 which forms a complex with IRAK4 and IRAK1 and TRAF6 and this complex results in formation of again type 1 interferon and nuclear factor kappa beta. So apart from these two receptors which are present in the endosomes, we have some cytosolic receptors like the MDA5 and the RIG1. 
these two can also detect the viral replication products. So once they detect the replication product, they interact with the mitochondrial proteins that is the FADD and the TRAV3 and then they produce caspases resulting in formation of nuclear factor kappa beta and type 1 interferon. So once this most important type 1 interferon is produced, what it does is it goes into the circulation and reaches the other cells where through the jack stat pathway it produces some proteins which interact with the nucleus and reduce the production of the viral replication products and thereby reducing the viral load and reducing the viral replication but if every time the virus was defeated by our body then we would not be having any infections but that is not the case we have a lot of cases of SARS-CoV-2 infections so how does the virus bypass this pathway well, it does it predominantly by inhibiting the type 1 interferon by inhibiting the nuclear factor kappa beta and the jack stat pathway apart from these two mechanisms there are also mechanisms like viral mutation immune exhaustion immune deviation by th2 biases so these are the methods by which the SARS-CoV-2 reduces the innate immune response to the body. So what is the importance of the innate immunity? As we have seen, there is a lot lesser infection in children. This could be because of the very good innate immunity that is present in the children. Apart from this, we see a lot more infection in patients who, who are vulnerable. That is the patient who are hypertensive, who have diabetes, who have CKD, who have a coronary artery disease or cardiac issues. So what happens is these patients have a reduced innate immunity which predisposes them to a severe infection especially in case of COVID-19. So let's see how the adaptive immune response reacts to the COVID-19 infection. So once the interferon and the nuclear factor kappa beta enter into the circulation, what do they do is they predominantly help the T cells in producing cytokines and recruiting cells for cytotoxic activity. While at the same time, the B cells are also able to produce antibodies. So the seroconversion can be seen from 4 day to 12 weeks. This is the data for SARS. This is not the data for SARS-CoV-2. And uh, the IgM is seen to disappear by 12 weeks. While IgG is expected to provide long term immunity and is been seen in almost 80% of the SARS infections even after 6 years. But cellular immunity is more important than humoral immunity in an active infection. CD4 and CD8 counts are always low in peripheral blood, especially in severe infection because they are actively recruited into the infected sites, predominantly the lungs. So what we find is there is always a lymphocytopenia and increase in neutrophil counts. So how do we get a cytokine storm? So as we saw, the innate immunity is very, very important, especially the generation of the type 1 interferon. So here as we see, if there is a protective and regulated inflammation, it is results in non-robust virus replication because there is an early in interferon response. This results in increased pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, increased inflammatory macrophages and neutrophil infiltration, thereby removing the virus with minimal epithelial and endothelial apoptosis, reduced vascular leakage and protective immunity and ultimately the host survives. But this group of patient is not something which we are concerned with. What we are concerned with is the patient who actually land up in the hospital, that is who have a dysregulated immune response. In these patients, there is a delayed interferon response and there is a robust viral replication. This results in more and more cells getting infected with the virus. So as more and more cells get infected with the virus, the number of cytokines generated is grossly increased and this results in more and more recruitment of the macrophages and neutrophils. This especially 
results in damage to to the epithelium and endothelium by apoptosis there is a increased vascular leakage because of the cytokines and the chemokines there is a suboptimal t cell response and there is a impaired virus clearance this especially the cytokine response results in acute lung injury and ards so what happens is when there is a immune response the increased cytokines they attack the endothelium epithelium and alveoli which subsequently result in increased production of interleukin 1 interleukin 6 8 tnf so these things result in activation and migration of the neutrophils once the neutrophil enters into the alveoli it releases again more chemokines and degranulations thereby damaging the endothelium and epithelium further once the alveolar barrier is breached there is always flooding of the alveolus and resulting in ards here we see the first pathological sample of covid-19 the a square deals with the right lung here and the b with the left lung both show ards changes especially in the a in b there are some early changes for ards but one thing that is to be noted is the increased infiltration of the lymphocytes the same infiltration is also seen in the c and d that is c is the liver and d is the heart so predominantly there is a lymphocytic infiltration and some neutrophilic infiltration apart from this we can see that there is a defective hyaluronan synthesis this results in increased production of these uh, hyaluronans and they result in accumulation of more water into the alveolus and more flooding of the alveolus so to summarize this is what we know till now the disease can be divided into two parts that is a mild disease and a severe disease what happens in a mild disease is there is a good innate immune response there by generating a good antiviral cytotoxic response and removal of the virus and finally the disease is mitigated but what happens in a severe disease is the innate immune response is not adequate so the cytokines keep on accumulating as more and more cells get infected and thereby a cytokine storm happens which results in a very severe form of disease resulting in ards and hemophagocytosis regarding treatment of this cytokine storm there is a lot of controversy we will be covering this in our subsequent presentations but what has been seen is that if give a steroid early in the therapy it results in increased viral replication and more severe disease so we need to time the dose of steroid when to do it to give it or not we will be covering in our next presentation thank you for your patience